Hello, Signet friends. Robbie Letby here. The interview that you're about to watch is just 20 minutes taken from an hour-long chat I had with two of the stars from the first production I ever directed here at Signet, The Mother Effer with the Hat. Those two actors are Larry Brown and Esteban Andres Cruz. This is the first in a series of interviews that I'm calling Where Are They Now? It is part of several programs we have rolling out at Signet to help keep artists employed. So thank you for watching. If, if COVID was really wanted to attack anything, what does COVID hate more than anything in the world? Theater. theater. It hates theater. It hates people in a closed environment, sitting up close to each other with people spitting and spraying across the room. When you, when you act, you can spit 26 feet. Oh, and I've seen you act, Larry. You can spit even further and shoot it. So. Let me just express my total appreciation and gratitude to you as well as um, Sean and everybody over at Signet because they helped me. They helped me significantly, you know. When I found Signet Theater, Sean was always so welcoming and inviting for me to come and audition for parts um, that I was right for, of course. And um, we made that happen several times. And that, you know, th there's no better training than being on this on the stage. But what happened with me and Girgis during Motherfucker was that I realized that this is my playwright. This is my Shakespeare. This is my August Wilson, you know, um, because he speaks for me. Because a lot of the plays that I'd done before that, like Latino theater, was like, if you say chancla and tortilla, then all of the white people in the audience felt really good about coming and seeing you on stage. And they're like, oh my God, we saw all these Latinos and black people on stage and we didn't feel threatened at all. Um, so I never felt comfortable with that kind of work. And when I got to do Stephen's work, it was, it was unapologetic. It was honestly me. The poetry was pedestrian in a way that like flows out of my, my mouth on an everyday basis. And I was like, this is real, you know, it's real. And that's the kind mm -hmm. of work. I hate seeing your academic bullshit work on stage. Like the one thing I hate seeing on stage of an actor is their work. I want to see their humanity. Mm -hmm. and, and with Stephen's, it's impossible to rely on technique. Um, you have to, you gotta know your, you gotta know your shit. You gotta, you gotta have chops, but you have to be able to access that part of you that is human, that mm -hmm. is ugly, that is vulnerable, mm -hmm. and that is honest. You can't bullshit mm -hmm. in his plays. And Larry knows that because he was beautiful in the show. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a catalyst, that production, working with Signet and you and Sean and the whole cast was a catalyst for me because mm. it was during that process that I wrote my agents in Chicago and I said, guess what? I know the vision for my career. You may not have a lot of actors that know that, but I know that, so listen to me now and believe me later because mm. I know what I want and this is what I want. I wanna be known as the national interpreter of Steven's work. So that's where Steven, that's where Signet was for me on my trajectory was it was a place where I could really, you know, a character that I was already in love with, with a playwright who I already have this intimate relationship with. Like, you ever have those relationships with dead musicians and you're like, oh my God, I feel like I know you, you know? Like, I know your soul because I know your work. I know your person. I know you, you have that thing and you're like, this is, you are, you are my family. Why did I get into this acting game? Mm. What did I get into this acting game so that I could be Brad Pitt and and roll and roll on a cruise, or did I get into it because me? I can I, the one thing I love about the the plays that I've been a part of, and I don't think I've been a part of a, of a production yet that hasn't fulfilled this. But I love where a story is told, and people can walk away having learned something. Hopefully, mm. that. Or, or, or shown a new perspective or uh, an eye has been opened. And that's what I enjoy about acting. The only difference between me and motherfucking Brad Pitt is millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I'm much better looking. Like that's the only difference. <laughs> we need to remember about our art form is that it is rooted in spirituality. It is rooted in healing and healing communities. Yeah. 
And I Amen. think that when we forget that is when it becomes just pure diversion and entertainment. Yes. But once I get the lines in me, it's, I just kind of like let my spirit do what it does. And there's a, there's a surrendering over almost to something. Correct. Like yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Sexy. <laughs> I love it. Look at the difference for, um, black theater and Latino theater versus white theater or institutions that are predominantly white um, is that we never left our relationship to the spirit. That's not anything that we've ever questioned about our process, our culture, you know. People, people who aren't able to express themselves like you just mentioned, I call them muffled artists. Mm. <clears throat> I yeah. believe my I believe my fiance is one like she's she should have been an artist and she's mm. had to muffle it in order to you know you know life but yeah I'm you know that's a really beautiful oh, way of putting it Larry and I think you know if we think about dreams and how they're associated with like children and like quit daydreaming and like you know blah 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 whatever right. about dreams if you get a room full of like five-year-olds and you ask them Oh, who here is a dancer? They're like, me, 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 mm -hmm. me, me. You say, who here is a singer? Me, 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 me. Who here is an actor? Me. Everybody raises their hand. You get a room full of adults together, and you'd be like, who here is a dancer? And they'd be like, well, I work in accounting. You know, and like, <laughs> people yeah. are so afraid to claim that joy. What we do, however, that, that theater storytelling ends up manifesting itself, the only way that it can exist is to offer healing. Um, we've moved past Amen. a time, I believe, where, where just, just there's no frivolity. We mm. don't have, you know, that's like the distraction part. Like after, after the war, and we had all of these great musicals that came out of, you know, the, our identity as, as Americans. Uh, it was necessary to have those stories and that divert us from like, hey, Hitler just happened. So like, let's, let's, let's get something, let's make the world nice again. And we, we've been trying to get to that, but America was not great and it, it was never great and it will never be great again. If we keep trying to reinvent that nostalgia for ignoring shit that is real. Pivot. So we have to acknowledge- we have Theater can be healing if theater can push us and change the narrative, maybe it needs to be a place of repentance. Maybe it needs to be Ooh. a place mm. where we can come and we can repent for our ancestors, repent for mm. how our actions have reverberated mm. in this country and affected mm. other people. And if mm. maybe theater, maybe theater needs to use what it's really good at, what it, where it's not film, where, where theater is a place where we breathe the same air, our heartbeats mm. become in sync, we laugh and cry mm. at the same time. Mm but also it provides us with the chance to participate, to implicate us somehow. I mean, maybe, mm. maybe there's a place for theater to be a place of going, I gotta, I gotta be the first ripple. I Everybody's a part of this thing that is yeah. bigger than ourselves in an effort to uh, raise up humanity. Yes. Um, yeah. And I love that, that concept in, in your process too, Larry, of like our job, um, as artists in specifically as, as storytellers, I think is yeah. the word that you use, um, that these, these stories are like Shakespeare. They, they're able to be told over and over again because these are human, human issues that we're dealing with. They're human traumas that we're trying to heal. And whoever, uh, you know, subscriber can come and see it and be like, oh my God, I, I've never met a trans person before but now I understand a little bit more about what it means to be a trans that's, person. That's the point of what we do. That's the point right there. Show the humanity. And so, yeah, I think our job and our place is a nudge. You know, we nudge mm -hmm. humanity Amen. towards a better mm -hmm. and broader understanding Amen. of itself. I think Amen. that's so important. I mean, I think that what, what we're talking, what you're talking about is like empathy bridges. And yeah. you mm. can create a bridge of empathy but only in the audience member can they have compassion to soften themselves to, mm. to then take it and do something with it, you know? Yeah. And so these traumas are inherited 
and we feel them when we walk out into the world and we receive what people perceive in the history of our traumas. And so our, our responsibility with the platform that we have as artists to our communities and to the healing of both those individuals and ourselves is to tell these stories of these traumas, not to the point to make people feel bad and guilty and like, how dare you? But I mean, in a way, kind of. Um, but more, <laughs> more importantly, that to show our job is to show human dignity. Amen. And that we, these vessels of these brown, queer, cross-eyed uh, black people that you see in front of you mm. are human, people. just like you. Just that's, people. That's, that's our job. We're just human. So mm. our job is to show and celebrate the humanity yes, of, of the people that, that we're presenting on stage. It's like all the theaters are trying to drill a new well. And what you're saying is we need to take a step back and we need to ask ourselves, how do we define the water? How are we using the water and how are we distributing it? Because That's right. it may be well, it's like, someone else needs to drill the well too. If we're taking and, and who has access to that water? Exactly. It's, it's like all the restaurants that have been successful during COVID. We just got to know how to pivot. Some, some restaurants have been really successful and it's all about the pivot move. I think that so, that's key. It's a pivot and not a continuation. If we correct. keep going la la la, we're going to continue the same way. It's not. There has to yeah. be a pivot. Has to be a pivot. Yeah. I'm very hopeful that everything kind of what everything returns to some some form of normalcy. And and that's yeah. I I hope it doesn't come to like we have to do theater online. That's as, as much as I would appreciate it if that's all that there is, but there's something to sitting in the theater there's, and, and feeling the actors. There's something to the actors um, telling their story in front of a live audience. There's something to it. There's a connection that's made that I can feel and that I feed off of when I'm on stage and it would not be the same if it were the opposite. And I don't think people sitting at home watching theater are going to get the same experience i did feel pre-pandemic that i was more of a human doing and mm. now it's been nice to be see what it feels like to be a human being you know mm. so if you say oh well, we're going to announce a season and the season's going to come back in the spring you go well that actually isn't true because yeah. you can't you don't know that to be true and we don't know what the future is going to hold, but I think we have to be comfortable holding that ambiguous loss and going, mm. I'm going to sit with that. And maybe mm. in this pause, we're going to learn how to find a more inclusive space and a, a space that is more artist centered. And it might mean that, like you said, the whole model needs to shift completely. Uh, Sean, Sean. Sean, my God, my God, I mean, to see that in person, to go walk through those doors and sit down in the audience and see what this person, it's mind blowing. I, is, I love seeing Sean's work and it's not gonna translate over film you know, on, online. It's just not gonna yeah. translate. And, and the music, you're not gonna feel the music the same way. I mean, there's so much work that goes, so much, so many people are putting so much hard work into theater to make it a beautiful thing. I'm just very optimistic and hoping it doesn't go away. That's just where I'm at. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Me too. I'm gonna be very gentle with you, Larry. I know. Very gentle so I, because I knew you was gonna take this, so I had to take the, uh, the other. I, uh, no, no, I know, I know, I know. And, <laughs> And Poppy, I feel, I feel the same way about all of those things that you mentioned. I just worked with Sean on a show in St. Louis and he's a genius. Um, genius. And I, you know, I feel all of those things. I mean, obviously we have a very similar experience in transcendence and our, yeah. our love for it. And theater is dead. Theater? is dead. Let me say it one more time for the people in the back. Theater is dead. Mm. The way that we've known it, the way that it's been, 
And Poppy, we should be very happy for this for people like you and me because we don't want it to come back the way that it was. Um, theater has always existed. When there were cavemen around a fucking campfire telling stories and taking burnt sticks and writing shit on the wall, that was motherfucking theater. All you need for theater is an audience and a storyteller. That's theater. Theater is an event. Theater is not a building. Mm. Theater is dead as far as we know, the way that we know it. What we, what we need to do to move forward is to figure out how do we tell the stories and what are the stories that need to be told and how do we tell it safely. Right now is a time for innovation and right now is a time for us as the imaginative artists that we are to become imagineers and not just think of what are the stories that need to be told, but how do we tell them? And how do we tell them in a safe way? I don't disagree with 99% of what you're saying. I think I'm just a little confused on when you say theater's dead, but at the same time you're saying stories need to be told. I think it's very healthy to be uncomfortable, and I think it's very healthy to live in contradiction and to live in a question. We're so, we're so obsessed with finding the answers to things, but we seldom stay, stay in the question long enough to really try and figure out what the question actually is. So that's what I gotta say about that, first of all. And then secondly, storytelling. We are storytellers in the way that our ancestors taught us that our traditions and our stories of our people that have been erased from history books, that have been shut out from main stage theaters, we'll do your show, but we'll do it on the smaller stage. Or we'll do your show, you can play this role, but not at the you know, big theater you can go do it in the community. When we go to the black communities, then you can do that role. The other thing, here's, here's the bottom line of it, of it all is, we are like roaches. You can take away the theaters. You can, you can take away the unions. You can take away all that shit. We're still gonna be telling stories. We're still gonna need the attention. We're still gonna need this. We're still gonna need to make people laugh because I'm an ass and that's my nature. So like, it's going to happen, you know, it's going to happen, hell or high water, but we're not doing what we've been doing and we are not settling for what we've been given and what we have been, what we have been told we deserve. Now we know our own worth. Now we know our own value. And now it's time to stand up for mm -hmm. us and for the stories that we want to see told on stage. Mm -hmm. If you really care about humanity, if you really care about being kind, being loving, and being just in the world. You, you agree that it's not right to kill a man, for a cop to kill a man based on the color of his skin. If you agree to that, then use the privilege and platform that you have to uplift these voices, to show their humanity, to show that they have dignity too. Mm. It's been a wonderful, wonderful chat with both of you, and I love and miss you both. And Motherfucker with the Hat continues to be one of my top favorite process uh, of rehearsal and productions. I mean, it was from the fucking crazy transitions we had to your performances and the story that was told. I mean, I look back and it was such fondness, and thank you for that. I love those transitions. Those transitions were gorgeous. They were so fun. I was yeah. thinking when I was watching it the other day, it brought me back. I was like, fuck, I forgot how much fun I was having <laughs> in between the fucking scenes. <laughs> yeah. I was I was having lots of fun. Uh, getting, we all I mean, we all were. We were fucking having a great old grand oh, time. That was joy. That was pure joy. I loved coming out on the bed when the bed yeah, got I know you floated did. out. <laughs> With the hat on. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, oh my God. So good. I remember so reading good. in the rehearsal report or performance report one day, as the bomb that you threw a carpet, like you threw the rug and it leapt out of your hands and it went into the bomb or in the audience or something. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit. Because I had that magical moment where the carpet was rolled up and it just goes boop. And then you put it on the ground on the stage. And I went boop. And it, Flew. It just flew. And I was like, oh, my little wispy hands, my little hands. <laughs> I told you, weak wrists, weak wrists. Oh my God, we were having a good time. God. It was a lot that. of fun. Thank that. you both. Oh, I yeah, love you guys. You. I love you love so much. You Thank too. you. Thank you for this. Talk to you later. Thanks for watching. Bye.